Um, and I think Michelle is going to start us off. I am going to start, and it, it is a shame that we missed recording uh, that nice sort of like walk down memory lane, trying to <laughs> figure out how we know each other. Um, and uh, uh, for me, it has been amazing to think back to meeting you as a really young artist in the 2000s and um, to see where your work has gone and um, to see your success and this sort of amazing new format that you're, you're working with these days. And I wonder if you could talk about um, your origins as an artist um, and that, that arc of how you started out and where your art has, has come to at this point. I, I feel I've been reflecting on this recently, actually, and just how lucky I think I was to have so much support early on from like both uh, people who were teaching me at uh, U of T at Mississauga and like the Sheridan uh, program. Um, but then also like people in the arts community, like Bill Huffman, like did have this award that he would give to like a young artist. And that really like connected me to V tape because it was like, I made a video that was put in the hallway and it was just so well placed because I, everyone who worked at V-Tape would like pass it every day and then they ended up like picking up that piece and then you know just kind of was really lucky to have people who just told me kind of that I was an artist like I don't think that at that point I really even believed in it myself like I didn't know that I, I wasn't a person who was like I'm an artist from the beginning I think I was just doing things and then people were like you're an artist and I, I think that as my practice has continued, I feel like I still in that, <laughs> in that space where I'm just doing stuff and then people are like, oh, you're, in, you're doing a theater piece. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a theater piece. Okay, because like previously I was doing performance art and I would define it that way, but it's theater now, okay. And so it's like, I think that my work has always been kind of interdisciplinary and kind of interested in these, in these different things and have been very fortunate that people have kind of been like oh this is what we're doing too or like that they've found um connections to to the things that I'm interested in and you know from the very beginning it was working with found objects and things that have been uh items that people have kind of given away or lost in some way and and objects that are very mundane and and for me are interesting because I think that they just represent uh, the human experience in a way that I think I've said this before but like a memoir or a journal does very differently and does in a more self-conscious way versus these objects that I'm interested in are kind of more accidental or yeah like an answering machine tape it, it represents the day-to-day -day, the quotidian <laughs> um aspect of being alive and and tries to you know through my work and looking at these things trying to understand and connect to to people who I, I really don't know and who are strangers so I feel like that's been kind of like the through line and there's been a lot of tangents outside of that practice as well but that's kind of where I started and I, I keep going back to that in some way. I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about uh, sort of the the expansion of the format and when you present your work sort of moving from single channel video to such complex presentations um, that you're working with these days? I think, I mean, for me, it's always, I like the term artist because it's so big. And, and I think a lot of my work, it just really starts with the, the piece that I'm working with. And then I'm, I'm just trying to make something out of it. So to kind of say, I want to make a movie or something and then find the piece that goes to that form never really made sense to me. It was always like spent like my process so much as I realized, and it takes such a long time, I think, for people to actually understand what it is that they're doing until they've done it for several years. And they're like, oh, that's my, that's my process. But it, it really is spending a lot of time with this stuff before even like doing anything with it. And I think in that time of just looking at it over and over, listening to it over and over, um, I, I think it's kind of this time of like listening to what it wants me to make of it in a way. Um, and so like the, the form of this work is always like a response to kind of what is inherently in the material or, or what is like a good 
pair to bring out what the material is. So like for this early work, Dan Carter, which I think we have an excerpt of for the students, you know, it, it was an audio recording, it was an answering machine. And it just made sense to me that the thing that I could add to that was video because the soundtrack was already there in, it, it, in completion. And that piece um, was the unedited answering machine. And so that process is very similar in so many ways, I think, to say something bunny, which is using a found audio recording from the 1950s. Again, like using the unedited sound and then like adding these layers to contextualize that and frame it and like make that kind of you know this family who no one who's attending the show knows and aren't celebrities there's not nothing that's inherently like interesting about them to a, a stranger but to to really through that process of listening and, and creating context make those people feel extremely significant to the audience members so it's weird. It's like, I think that those two projects, even though they're separated by like 10 years are actually quite similar in some ways um, in, in process, but different in, in form. I love this conversation so much. And I love the, the like ongoing trouble of genre and <laughs> the way in which in some ways the work tells you what it needs to be or how it needs to sound or what it needs to look like. And, you know, we definitely reckon with genre wildly in the field school. And I would be so curious when we reached out to you and said, you know, we're putting together this feminist art field school mm -hmm. and we'd love for you to be a featured artist. Did you have any immediate reactions to the container of feminist art field school as a concept? And did you find yourself immediately identified or repelled by or curious about any of those categories of of engagement? I think that for me, I am okay with multiple categories on me. And I think that that's, you know, it's like, I, I grew up mixed race. I think that in some ways from a very early age, I just was like, oh, I'm both things and neither and all of the, like, it's just that like the more categories that you put on me actually makes me feel more accepted by more people. And like, I think in some of the research that I've been doing this past summer about like my dad's uh, side of the family's history with Japanese internment in Canada have just been thinking so much about exclusion and belonging. And so when people in, in, invite me into something that, that feels, that doesn't feel bad to me, if, if you, if that, if it's some way that it's a way to connect to that person, I think labeling can often be inclusive um, and, that usually feels like like a good thing for me. I think it, if labeling is you're that, and that's when it kind of feels like, okay, why do you think of me in, in that way? But I think that in this context, I'm like, please, yes. Like, and, and how do you see, and I also like to understand how people see it that way too, and how people are labeling it as like, as feminist, which is great. Like, it makes me feel really happy that, that, that the work's labeled that way. Um, and yeah, again, like you, you make work and sometimes you're just making it and it's not until you have space from it too, that you even understand what it's doing or how other people see it. Um, and I think because I started making work when I was like 20, 21, I don't think I even understood kind of like the artistic references, um, that, or other artists that were making work that was similar that people would compare it to. Like I didn't even, um, I wasn't like, I kind of knew Cindy Sherman, but like, I didn't really know her catalog of work. And then, you know, as people made reference to her work or like Sophie Cal, I was like, oh yeah, I love it. There is an affinity, but like, I didn't even know that that existed. And I felt like so um, excited to even that something that I made would even reference these people in a way that have been making this work for years and years and years before me. I was um, reading an article in Momus about Bridget Moser yesterday, and um, the, the writer was talking about a tendency to dismiss her work because it's funny um, and, uh, you know, sort of talking about the difficulty that certain critics have of accepting humor in serious art and um, as we were getting ready for this conversation with you, you were you came to my mind as I was reading that article as well. And I was also thinking about when I did see your work back in the 2000s and, um, you know, I was 
a little more than 10 years out of graduate school where we kind of practiced a very sort of um, rigid feminism, maybe, <laughs> as, as feminist theory was being introduced to the art history department at, at York. Um, it was done so with, with certain rules. And one of, one of the rules was um, that uh, in order to avoid objectifying women, you didn't uh, depict women in art. Um, so there was a, a kind of tendency towards the, the conceptual as a way to avoid this. And I can remember being like, very sort of uh, what's the word like almost destabilized by your work uh, when I first saw it because of this rule that I had in my head um, but also uh, you know contrary to that how much I loved it like how funny and engaging and compelling your work was and, um, uh, you know, is that, is that something that um, you've thought about? You know, you've just talked about how at the time you were just making work <laughs> and you weren't even calling yourself an artist. So I don't know how, um, how conscious you were of, of how you were sort of really shifting um, the way uh, women, usually you, <laughs> were depicted in art um, or uh, and if you weren't thinking about it at the time are you thinking about it now I think that um, there it's so interesting like just uh, starting off in like the the question of humor and um, I think humor is such a, a narrowing force and it's so um, it's like you really find a niche in humor, I find. Like, I, I feel like for me, my closest friends, the people that I connect to the most are people who share a similar sense of humor. Um, but I think all of the people that I know, we can all say the same thing is sad, but we can't always say the same thing is funny, or we can always say the same thing is dramatic. Like, I find that humor is actually um, harder to find like a shared humor with people there. I don't think that there's things that are objectively funny. That's also, it's like things that are funny to one person is offensive to another. And like, there, it, it's so, there's so many, um, <laughs> points on that scale for humor. But, you know, I think that if you make work that's like serious or political, it's kind of, um, often we all agree that it is that but humor is just so more it's I think it's challenging and I think that it, I really love when artists incorporate humor in their work because it is kind of saying like who are the people who find this this funny and that's not everyone um but yeah I think that w when I was making work and kind of putting my own body in the work I think that also I had kind of a naive uh, idea of what it was to be an artist and like when you put the the tag beside the work, it usually has one name on it. So I was like, I guess I have to do everything. I have to play all the parts and I have to, um, I did have people help me and my family members were like, you know, setting up, like panning the camera or like talking, like my sister at the time, I think uh, was such a huge collaborator on the work and giving me like music references and watching edits in it. And um all of these things were happening, but I was really like, this is my, my piece. So I, I just need to be all of the characters. And I think that that was for me a way to, to solve that issue of, um, you know, just thinking that art wasn't necessarily a collaborative process at that time. Um, and I feel like in the last 10, 10, 15 years, that's totally changed. And I, I think I really don't want to make work like that, um, without other people. I think that I've just realized you can make such different work if you're really having a lot of conversations and engaging different questions, which I think is the, the biggest thing that collaborators bring into that process um, is the, the questions they ask you about, about you know, for say something funny, the, one of the first conversations with the carpenter about making the, the set piece, the table, he's like, what do you want the texture to be? Like, what do you want it to feel like to the hand and like, and, and I didn't even 
think about, like I never made objects in my work that were immediately engaged with, with the audiences. It was often filmed, like I would make props and stuff, but it was often like through a, a camera and a screen or something. So it was so interesting to just like have these questions be asked for the first time. Um, I guess this is not really so much uh, talking about like representation of the body, but I think that I, I didn't have the same, um, I don't think that I had understood that, that that same history of kind of removing the the artist's female body from the the frame. Um, I, I don't think I have that role yet. And I think in not having the rule, you helped shift the rule because I'm, I mean, I think ultimately what I've come to really appreciate about your work um, uh, and the the range of um, examples that you shared with the class is that um, you sort of occupy this, this uh, space of ambivalence that um, uh, in terms of um, how uh, in thinking about feminist ideas or ideologies um, you have to think about desire and you have to think about um, um, what's the word I'm looking for like there's there's uh, you know your interest in music and fashion and crushes and <laughs> all of the things that you would sort of like pretend didn't exist if you were one of those rule following scholars of feminism in the early 1990s like I was. Um, of course that has to be incorporated um, if we're going to be realistic in the way we're talking about the world and um, uh, the way we relate to the world as, as women. Um, uh, I'm not sure if this is leading to another question or if I'm just closing off the conversation. Um, I don't no, know if it's anything I, else for you. I think, I mean, I think I've been thinking so much about desire recently and um, just, it's funny, I was listening to this episode of The Dig, it's a really great podcast, but um, Andrea Long Chu, uh, this amazing writer was just talking about <laughs> desire and how it's not always like, kind of politically correct like desire kind of exists outside of something that like aligns neatly with one's political beliefs or um and that it's also constantly changing and that like we're always kind of living in relationship to our desire at that moment and how it's not fixed and how it can change from like you know my desire as an artist and the work that I make is so different um from when I started but it's, it's connected, but it's like, I just like around collaboration and all of these things around like even how I understand myself um, and that I think what I hope to do with my practice is to leave space for that change and to not, um, I try not to like necessarily have strong opinion. Like I've always felt like wary of having, like I think I have a belief system, but I feel like I always want the chance to grow and to change in some ways and to like hear other people <laughs> differently and, and have that change who I am. And so, um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm kind of just trying to figure out like what it is to uh, not be attached to one way of doing things um, and to have that evolve over time through one's own desire and, and what they're seeing is like pleasurable also. I wonder if I could pick up on that. You know, I like to solidly identify as someone who was in the room in, I think, the early days of Say Something Bunny mm -hmm. in its run in New York. And what an extraordinary piece of work. And there's so much to think about there as it relates to 
desire, collaboration, found objects, archives, fabulation, performance, etc. And I was wondering if we could spend some time sort of unpacking that process, because I think you watch an excerpt or you're in the room and it's this gloriously executed, curated story. But of course, it involves ongoing collaboration with your partner and the collaboration of all of the bodies in the room to make that story possible. Could you invite us into some of your early process in the making of that work? Yeah, I mean, I think that say some like the timeline of say something funny, um, like, you know, the first probably five years of working on that project, like I think that I got the recording in 2011. And the first time I performed it, which was at Gallery TPW in Toronto was 2016. And that's when it was really um, developed in a lot of ways. Um, but the first probably five years from like, late 2000, like 2011 to late 2015 was really just um, listening to the recording, trying to make a transcript of it, just trying to like understand it, but not really like intensely working on it all the time. It was like one of those things where you pick it up, work on it for really long, work on it for a couple of days and then put it down and like not think about it for six months. But like in that time, it's kind of there, it's in the background, things that you encounter in life remind you of it. And then it would just be picked up again. Um, and then I think there was a presentation at Union Docs where I also work. And um, that's a space in Brooklyn that uh, Christopher Allen, who's my collaborator on Say Something Funny, also founded and, and runs. I did a presentation there. And in that presentation, it was just kind of an artist talk. But I played an excerpt, like a three minute excerpt of the recording and then just subtitled it. And the audience reacted to that. And that weirdly seemed like something was there with just not having to re-perform it and dress up as all the characters in this, which I think, you know, my earlier practice, that would have been an immediate way to deal with this piece, but just listening to it with people, which was something that I had been doing for years and years and years and had found enough pleasure in just that act of listening. Um, it, it felt like that connected to, to a live audience. So that was like a really important learning moment. And then, you know, Kim Simon from Gallery TPW asked me to do an, an exhibition in the space and you know it was supposed to it, she was really open with what form it could be and um i think in in talking earlier about form um i think doing say something funny in an art gallery made it what it was because we didn't have any of the the it ended up being kind of a theatrical piece a performance piece a piece that's you know you watch from the beginning to the end. It's something that you like sit down and there's an intermission. There's something that's very like a, a theatrical form of it. But because it was in an art gallery, we didn't have like a stage in relationship to the audience. Like we didn't have these kind of like already predetermined formal aspects of a theater space to kind of design the performance around. And so that was so freeing because it was like okay so what do we have we have a room we what can we put in this room how do we want to orient the audience in the room so it was like all of these questions that i think if you started in a theater space those questions would be answered already and so you wouldn't necessarily have the audience sitting around the table and the table being the set and my relationship to the audience in that space so um i think a lot about how like a lot of artists often have all these rules already set up for them that they're kind of following without really questioning like the form uh, the form of the space that they're making work in which i think is like part of a larger conversation that you you're all having in relationships to institutions and just kind of like the the art that's made to be in an institution and how that art is really like you know designed for an for an institution if you know you are in an in a space that has like 14 foot ceilings versus 20 foot ceilings that might change the work in a lot of ways. And, and I think especially in, in Canada where, you know, you have to have like often to get a grant, you have to have a space that you will potentially show it in. Uh, that was the case for Say Something Funny and our funding. Like we had the commitment of Gallery TPW. So that's how we could get funding to do the thing. And, and it's so much about this, like, which I think is also okay. Like, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Thing. like I think that making something that's specific is really interesting and like making something that's designed for a space that the table for say something bunnies 14 feet and it was that way because 
the size of Gallery TPW and we could build a table that big and how far apart we wanted people to be from each other. That'd be, if we made that piece today with COVID, the table would probably be a lot bigger, you know, we'd make it six feet apart or something. Um, but it was just like, you know, I think that the space and having the opportunity to show it in that, at an art gallery, gallery really made the work into this kind of like quasi performance piece, video, media, like we, we just could incorporate all the things that I had already been doing in my practice and like put it all in one thing. Um, that's a bit of the timeline. And also the, the process of the, the production of the work was actually like a very intense few months where um, a lot of it came together in a short period of time. Even though the work took about six years to, from the beginning to the end, the, like the production period was quite intense and short. Thank you. Um, as you just alluded to, we are very interested in thinking about um, the institution and uh, institutional critique. And um, we would like to ask you a question about what you think about um, whether or not institutions have a role to play in crafting better futures. But, you know, given that you've already uh, veered into um, talking about granting systems and uh, granting systems in Canada and that you live in the States now. I wonder if you want to expand uh, the question beyond institutional critique and just think, think generally about um, uh, kind of the spaces in which artwork is made in Canada versus the US and mm -hmm. Um, like what needs to, to shift for you to be able to do the greatest things that you can do? Yeah, the, um, I mean, for Say Something Funny, we, we ran it in New York and Chelsea and um, ran it for three years, and which is a pretty long time for like a, a solo show. Um, but also that was the result of kind of creating our, our own space. So instead of... Um, you know, Christopher and I were like, we want to bring this to New York, but like, should we like, we kind of uh, reached out to people at um, Doc Fortnite and we're like, should we do, try and do this at the MoMA for like a week? Like what makes sense? And then we're like, could we just find like a big room and set up our own space and just like make a theater out of a space that we used? Like we rented the old, um, the where Chase, where you saw it was like, actually a building that the Manhattan Project was in uh, years, years ago. It's uh, interesting history is there, but you know, we just really needed a room. And so like kind of created our own space or mini theater. Um, and that really seemed to work because we could extend it if it made sense. If we got a, we ended up originally only planning to run it for like maybe three months and then got a review in the New York Times and we're like, just sell more tickets, just sell more tickets and we'll find a new space because our lease was up. And so, you know, it was just like completely responsive to if people wanted to see it and they just kept wanting to see it. So it was kind of lucky for us. But um, I, I, it's funny, yesterday I was reading or I was listening to another episode of The, at the Dig, which was about um, counterculture and, and communes and was talking to this uh, author, Fred Turner, who wrote a book about, um, yeah, basically like communes and like counterculture in the 1960s and how there kind of was this like this one culture of people who were like protesting and like interested in politics and were like we need to change the system we need to change the institutions and then also these communes which were kind of like this like dropout of from the institution this kind of like we're just going to create our own world and our own reality and we're just going to live in our own space and like I feel like over the past years when I've done talks about say something funny I'm like I'm we're just like making our own theater we're making our own institution and then like listening to this um the podcast that it ended up being like quite critical of those spaces because they're often really like homo like if you look at like communes from the 60s they're like white people it's just like they're not diverse they're often like reproducing like heteronormative like relationships between men and women where the women are like barefoot and pregnant and like it's interesting how um there is kind of this ideal that also feels kind of like 
yeah, I, I don't know, like that there's something I think to be said about continuing to try to work within the institution and try to change those institutions. And like, um, also, I think that the thing that's fun is like, we kind of did our own thing, but people from the institutions came to our thing and they're like, oh, this is a different way to do it. But sometimes you have to prove it to the institution before they want to do it your way. So it's like, you know, I think it's kind of this back and forth and I'm not like a person who's like, I don't want to work with like museums, but I also just feel like there's a different sense of possibility in each of those spaces and like go back and forth and learn different things from both of those spaces and like um and teach things back to the institution from what you learned outside of it but like if you just are like i'm only interested in showing at like these big galleries then your practice is going to be a certain way to accommodate the kind of work that wants to be made and then if you if you try something different like the people in those spaces are actually quite curious to see something that's like trying to do it another way. There's so many sparks and connections to what you're saying to some of the work we're exploring with Allison Mitchell and Deirdre Logue. And I'm reminded of their incredible banners that say, you know, we can't compete that were then installed in the hall of the art gallery of Ontario. <laughs> and thinking about the sort of consumptive logics of institutions, but also the opportunity to be there and be in dialogue and the irresolvable frictions that come from that kind of engagement. And, you know, in the incredible showcase that you've offered up to us for the field school, you've included the Union Docs um, inductive thread video, mm -hmm. uh, which I had never seen before. And it strikes me that it is such an extraordinary opportunity to think about institutional critique and to think about a kind of excavation or an anatomy of a space. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if You know, what is my question here? I feel like I was just going to ramble and tell you everything that I think is so interesting about that work, but let me do a better job of being an interlocutor here. In what ways can we or do you harness critique through engagement with objects and trash or detritus? Mm -hmm. It's fun. The inductive thread, and just like you mentioning the inductive thread piece, and also in relationship to uh, talk about institutions, like, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, like Union Docs is an institution. And like when you're in it, you're just like, it's just this group of people doing weird things. Like it's just, and it, and institutions are structured so differently. And I think Union Docs is like pretty specific in that it is, it feels very like artist run and is like quite weird. It's kind of a weirdo space. That's like, um, I think that the board and the structure of Union Docs is actually very supportive of the vision of the people that work there versus it being the people who work there serving the vision of the board. So it has a very different feel as an institution, but that so many of these institutions are like just relationships of people. Like it's just really people and relationships and hopefully those can grow and different and weird ways and I think inductive thread was really like the detritus of like the bodies and hair and dust made by a lot of people who interact with with that space but it's like I think it really has so much to do with like how do we um how do we see institutions like how do we see um a relationship to an institution also to like make us feel like we're outside of it when it actually is like individual or I don't know it's it's a community I think institutions are often community but it's like in in working for an institution it's like I don't I don't want like I hope that people understand that they can reach out to me and that like it is a bunch of people working together but that's not the what we were talking about we we're talking about objects and and um and we were talking remember. about trash yeah because I think that there's something so interesting about your archive, if we want to use giant bunny <laughs> quotes around it, right? And how in some ways we can consider your archive to be one of trash, of yeah. discards, of leftovers, of remains. Yeah. And that uh, is to me, strategically and formally, a kind of push away from the materials of the institution, right? The white gallery walls, the canvas, the things that we come to associate with a kind of art market or an art culture. And there's a kind of thrifting mentality that's deeply embedded in But it's also, work. it's also kind of the inverse too, because like in so many ways, the institutions, if you think about the museum is completely 
engaged in the trap and what is found in the earth that's the remains of like previous um like you look at what is on display in like a natural history history museum in some ways it's it's not always the most prized object it's kind of like the part of a vase that someone just used for cooking every day and like it is and i was reading um sapiens um the huge like just at the beginning i'm not through it yet it's like a huge book but um just talking they were talking about like this piece of um this like sculpture that someone made but it's not necessarily like the most beautiful sculpture from the time it's just the one that survived and like i think so much about um like about that and and relationship to trash and it's not so much like the most beautiful recorded song ever it's just that the one that managed to survive and like how those are kind of the things that we can use to understand the thing, things that happened people's experience in the past and it's a bit more democratic than just like the most precious thing that we all agree on um as the most beautiful sculpted object it's just the one that like was in the right place at the right time and like didn't get crushed into a million pieces um i'm having a thought listening um, to you talk about that and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to articulate this properly but um, having worked most of my life in um, kind of mainstream white cube galleries there is uh, you know there's a desire to no matter what happens during the run of an exhibition or the presentation of a program there's always a desire to return the white cube to its sort of pristine state as though nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. um, so that piece becomes kind of a, um, a, a way of thinking about how to find the traces of the people <laughs> who really are the institution that for whatever reason the institution tries to erase. Um, so I'm looking to the director to see if I'm reading the cues right, right that perhaps I should ask the last question now. <laughs> Sounds great. I love our Zoom communication. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the last question is just, um, you know, simply what what is next for you and um, sort of within the larger context of the feminist art field school and the philosophies and ideas it raises what do you think is next for all of us oh my, my. i mean i try to be hopeful in that space but i've been listening to and reading some things that it's not we're not looking so good for all of us but um you know i i feel like it's it's funny there's a in, I just did a residency in, in June and July and just had the first time in a really long time to just think like, what, what am I going to think about next and what am I going to work on next? And um, I think in earlier emails kind of initially mentioned this project and I actually have the, um, the PDF here, but like my, my dad sent me an email that was a link to this 192 page document, which is um, all of the correspondence it's a it's a scanned microfiche of correspondence between the government and my um my dad's side of the family during their internment during world war ii and it's you know it's pretty heavy both as an object and like you know in terms of the type of the the quality of the material as an artist that um tries to kind of bring human humor and, and play and, and pleasure into to my work this is kind of like a, an intense thing to encounter and something that i'm not um so used to of dealing with such kind of like yeah heavy and serious material that has such deep implications and have just been thinking about that and um like the the short version of the story is like my dad's family was um in Vancouver, they lived in Steve, uh, Stevenson. Is that I? I always want to say Stevenson, but Stevenson um, in British Columbia, and then during World War II, were relocated to the um, to Manitoba, and all you know, they could take some of their stuff, but their house and all the objects in it remained there, and then were sold. And um, it, it's really unfortunate, but I just remember like reading this stuff and like just looking at this this um list this just list and inventory of the objects that they owned like it's just so interesting i've never seen a photo of 
of this home, but like there's lists and lists of, of, of the things that were in their house. And I just was like, had this epiphany where he's like, is this some sort of weird, like intergenerational trauma that's like, makes sense why my practice is completely oriented around the objects that people left behind and are disconnected from their original owners and like trying to really make sense of this thing that someone owned that they're no longer with and what that says about them. And I had never pieced that together before. And I don't know if that's just me like projecting, but there is a, this click that just made so much sense and just my interest in this. Um, I was I was talking to my friend Lauren, who was hanging out with her her cousin, um, who is who who's pregnant and about to have a child, and she was saying that like when you're born, um, all of the eggs that you will ever release during your like reproductive time are already in your body when you're a, like a fetus or about to be born, which means that you were as an egg in your grandmother's womb when she she was alive which was just such a i mean her telling me that i was like so interesting that like i as a piece of matter as a tiny egg was in my mother as a fetus in my grandmother and that matter that made me is from the body of my grandmother and that that actually was a thing so it's just i don't know it's like all of this stuff and um really trying to understand a lot of complex things about like my present moment around around exclusion around uh belonging thinking a lot about like incarceration recently in relationship to this and and really trying to understand not only like i i think i'm less interested in the moment of of trauma of the relocation and i'm very interested in what happens after um which i feel like people might not be as interested in, in in thinking about and maybe that's kind of where like the joy can come from me is um understanding how one gets through that um in a way that creates family in a different way i don't know um it's a very new project and it's it's so um it's so much in these like early forming stages but um it it feels so relevant to how exclusion works um in relationship to fear and like how we often want to push away things that we fear will happen um versus what is actually happening um which i think is just in like the fear of japanese people japanese canadian citizens like turning on canada was the reason officially why they were relocated but there wasn't actually any evidence for that anyway um and it's heavy does, it's not funny I, I like how can i make this work i don't know <laughs> i mean i love too in our early conversations the extraordinary connections to jordan stanger ross's project landscapes yeah. of injustice I which is so. also at uvic and oh, ugh, great. amazing and we will be sure to link to the project as well as a part of our module so that students and participants can explore and, and chart these connections as well. What an amazing feat um, of, of research and um, digitize, like just, this is such an amazing book and just recontextualizing this history from like a contemporary perspective. And just like, there's this one chapter that's just about like, it's like a character study basically of the, main administrator behind the dispossession which is like such a for me as like um an artist i'm just like what an amazing way to talk about this thing that happened through looking at the, like a personality of an a per individual who is like pushing this stuff forward it's really an amazing amazing book and also online archive and yeah university of victoria <laughs> Thank you for spending time with us today. We deeply appreciate it and are ever energized by your work. There's so much more to say, but I appreciate you guys uh, both talking to me and just taking the time to even look at the work. I appreciate your eyes on it and to the students as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. Great.
Well, is there <laughs> anything that you, um, in your so much more to say that you feel like you're gonna log off with us and think like, oh, but I came on that Zoom in order to say the following thing? No, there wasn't anything pre-planned. I just appreciate, I don't, I think that when you were talking about the white wall, um, I was, it just made me think about, like we were talking about trash and like the white wall and just kind of the inverse of that, which is kind of the hoarder space and how like it's impossible to actually comprehend objects in a space that's so dense and like how, like the use of the white wall, how, you know, the, the white wall can sometimes be kind of like, uh, it's so, I don't know, we want to work against that some ways, but also how that can, what it does, like what it does to something that um, otherwise would be completely like unseeable in a different context. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think that I, ha I have all, I mean, there's so many different rants and stuff where I'm like, I probably shouldn't go into that thinking. I don't know if I want to like commit to that officially on video, <laughs> but I, I think that there's like a way in which um, like this, the feeling of, I, I've just been thinking about like institutions and like my own, like coming back to desire, like my own desire to be like in an institution and what that means for your ego in some ways. Like, I think it's very much for me tied to that and how I think with the performance, um, I think something really clicked for me in just doing it in my own space where I could have these one-to-one -one connections to people and there's no pressure. Like, I think a lot of times people want to like optimize, like how many people see the show so that they, like it can just work in a different way when you're just like, we're just committing to 25 people at a time and, and that's what it is. And that, that allowed me to have like a different experience with the audience that I really want to continue in future works. And whether that's in an institution or not, I feel like that was something that really felt important to me and like certain I think levels of care in creating a, a different space or a curious space or like how we would kind of like train the person who is like taking the tickets and getting drinks like that all all was part of it which I also appreciated that in creating it creating a space of my own that I could train those people myself versus having the institution train those on on my behalf because I think especially with theater like the performance doesn't start when like the lights go down the performance starts when you like walk up to the space it's the, the entire experience of like how you're made especially in a piece that's like immersive and interactive like say something bunny there's all of these things that you have to like do to make the audience feel comfortable because if they're like what's going on what am I supposed to do and they sit in that chair they're gonna give a very different energy to me so it's like all of this like prep work to make people feel comfortable and, and safe and cared for and um these things extend even after the performance and like continuing to try to engage with people or talk to them about um if they had an epiphany during the show like we I would still chat with people after the the performance and so it's like you know what are the bounds of work too like it, it doesn't necessarily just um I think in performance you, your body is so much part of the work that um I think a lot of people who work in maybe object-based work might not have that same relationship to their audience where they like develop a relationship by having actual shared time together say something funny it's two and a half hours where we're physically together in a room and that to me is very significant because you I really spend time looking in the eyes of, of these people and I, I've seen them on the street and I'm like, how do, how do I know you? And then they'll be like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like that's happened a couple of times. And then we figured out that they just like came to the show and they're like, oh, your hair is different or something. I don't know. So it's just, it's a, it's a, I think it's a luxury to be able to, to have that and have time with people who are experiencing your work. And in some ways I'm like, I'm around like if you have this module in a time and you want to have like I'd love to talk to the students if they have ideas and just also hear where they're they're at and thinking I think um, I really hope that like this work can be useful in making people feel like there's like different possibilities in the ways that they can make work and so I really love sharing my work with people who are, are making um, but also not just making in terms of our work but writing or like think thinking and like trying to do that. So just to 
say I'm, I'm available if you guys want to jump on a, a zoom call with your class if that's if there are moments that are not um, asynchronous. Well, we love that, and I assure you that we are going to sign <laughs> off of this Zoom, and I'm going to take you up on it. Okay, perfect. Thanks again.